All right. Um, well, thank you, Danny. Um, I'm also a regional extension agent in um, Alabama and for home horticulture, and we're glad to have all of you joining us um, from across the United States today. Um, we're blessed to have Norm Haley. Um, since 2012, he's been uh, serving as a regional extension agent for forestry, fisheries, and wildlife management for the Alabama Cooperative Extension System in Northeast Alabama. Um, his primary background is in fisheries. He graduated from Auburn University with a master's in aquatic ecology in 2009. Prior to joining Extension, um, he held a position as a fisheries biologist for two and a half years with a private lake management company in North Alabama, where he worked throughout seven southeastern states. So uh, we're really thrilled to have Norm with us today and excited to hear what you have. Thanks, Norm. Thank you, Mallory. <clears throat> Um, not quite a bug, but certainly a pest that a lot of folks across the nation are dealing with. And we've got quite a diverse audience today. And just really thank you all for tuning in and hope we can maybe teach you a trick or two or a thing or two about uh, feral hogs, if not their ecology, definitely their control that you can pass on to clients, neighbors, friends, and family, whoever. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Some of the uh, ecology behind the hog problem that we have, and then also some of the, not only the effective control techniques, but also some of the maybe uh, less or, or even non-effective control techniques that folks have had experience with across the country. Um, so today you're gonna hear me kind of interchangeably use the terms, and it's not just myself, it's other professionals and, and clients and, and, and the public between wild hogs or wild <coughs> swan, wild pigs or feral hogs, feral swan, feral pigs. They're, they're all referring to the same animal. Um, it's, it's Sue Scroffa, it's all derivatives from that essentially, but um, they were brought to North America in the early 1500s. They, they, they do not belong on this continent. They are not native. Um, so in the early 1500s, they were brought over by Spanish settlers for, for a food source. That's an animal that traveled really well and, and did well in a lot of different uh, habitats and, 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 um, and conditions. So that's how they first set foot on, on this continent. And then, of course, as European settlement came into, came into place, there was a lot of free range livestock practices, which also uh, helped to distribute the, uh, the hog population throughout the East Coast there. Um, and then in the 1900s, we begin to see Eurasian and, and Russian hogs um, pop up, uh, primarily brought over here for, for hunting and recreational interests. Um, so just kind of a, a, a quick history here. Um, here's the uh, wild hog distribution in 1982. You can see it's it's pretty fine scale. We had a really good handle of, of where hogs were. You can even see it mapped out here by, by watershed and, and also uh, uh, density. Um, but our next map here, as we click over to 2015, uh, we kind of threw the watershed and fine scale mapping out of the window and just started to map the hog distribution by counties throughout the United States. And you can see that's quite a rapid expansion, um, you know, in just a little over 30 years. So we'll just go back and forth from that really quick, 1982. So all of a sudden, just an amazing rapid expansion in 2015. And if you look up in other areas, um, like uh, you know the Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan, and we see some in Wisconsin and some of the northeastern states, you know those hogs didn't pick up and all of a sudden pop their pop up there by their own. We're going to talk more about that as we go here. So, why have uh, feral hogs expanded the way that they have? Uh, the biggest one outlined there in red is the fact that you know we as humans have, have humans have trapped and transported and released them, and that's really picked up in frequency over the last few decades, as, as you can see by that the, or that mapping distribution that I just put up there. Um, but there has been dispersal from those other uh, populations as, we, as we've uh, you know, brought them from state to state and county to county. Um, they begin to get a pretty good stronghold and, and can rapidly disperse from there as long as the habitat conditions uh, allow them to. Um, but there also have been uh, escapees from domestic populations and also hunting operations, whether they get through the, the, the fencing or are even uh, sometimes purposely released, you know, the, the owners or the, or the landowners or the, um, the, uh, whether it's, uh, from a livestock operation or hunting operation, they can no longer take care of those animals. They, they've often just let them go. Um, the other big thing too, and you're, you're, you're going to hear this a lot throughout the presentation is they're generalist omnivores or opportunistic omnivores. A hog can really make use out of, uh, from, from the nutritional aspect out of a wide variety of different foodstuffs. And we'll talk about that more in a later slide. They have very few natural predators. 
uh, throughout the landscape and they really do favor some very rough um, uh, landscapes like especially swamps of uh, places that are very impenetrable or, or uh, just just inhospitable to humans to, to get in there and get after them so that helps them a bunch on that uh, side of things too as far as their um, uh, protection from cover they do have a keen sense of smell and hearing uh, they can they can find food very well and they can uh, escape uh, predation primarily through um, uh, uh, the human pressure just by hearing and, and smelling the uh, humans approaching. Uh, they can be very nocturnal, especially when they're when they're pressured. And they are very intelligent and pressure sensitive animal. If they're getting pressured by predation, whether it's humans or humans or um, as, as younger animals uh, by some of the uh, carnivores we have, they will uh, push and move out of those areas. And they also have a very high reproductive potential and very high uh, reproductive success that we're going to hit on uh, quite a bit here later. So. Exactly how fast are they spreading? Like I said, they're they're being transported and moved and moved about across the landscape by human uh, in, in interactions. Um, so they're moving across uh, highways at 65 to 70 miles an hour. Um, and for the most part, across the United States, it is illegal to trap and transport feral hogs. There are some exceptions to that, but but uh, in in general, we shouldn't be moving moving hogs here and there. As far as biology and reproduction is concerned, these are just kind of the the, the stats that we like to throw out there as far as far as averages are concerned we see adults weighing between 100 to 500 pounds gestations relatively short um, 115 days just a little over four months or just a little under four months um, litter size they can range from four to 14 piglets that's going to be based on habitat and also the age and maturity of that pig um, the younger piglets that come into sexual maturity at six to eight months will have those smaller litter size where your more established sows can certainly have larger and again, with that short gestation, you're looking at two to three litters per year, and they're going to breed year round. As soon as a sow um, um, uh, drops that litter, she comes into heat very shortly afterwards and is able to um, begin producing a, another litter of piglets. And the home range is variable, but in in, in the average habitats that you know we see pigs um, surviving in, they're they're able to make make do on about that 800 acre landscape scale. Um, which is also part of the control that we'll talk about later on. If you don't have access to controlling 800 acres, uh, very important to cooperate with uh, neighboring landowners and properties on their control. For biology and reproduction, we'll continue on with that. You know, we hear the term the hog bomb, and this is kind of where that comes from. That short gestation time along with uh, those relatively large and successful litter sizes of four to eight piglets, it's going to basically equate to a lot of hogs hitting the landscape in a hurry. If just that pair of hogs shows up on a property, um, I mean, essentially in less than a year, under good conditions and very little uh, predation, you're going to look at about 26 hogs um, that, that have spawned from, the, from those, or 24 hogs that have spawned from those two initial hogs in just one season. And then on, on account of that, just 14 months later, those initial offspring are now able to reproduce too. So you can really see some um, just, just amazing population uh, level explosions based on just one pair of breeding hogs, especially with good habitat and low mortality. That's where the term hog bomb is, is, uh, is referenced to. So here we are again, back to the, the, the opportunistic omnivore. Um, it's a big reason why they've spread and a big reason why they cause so much trouble is that they can really make use out of so many different um, food sources. And you see the long list here from, from crops, tubers, uh, insects, um, all the way to small mammals and then and then any waste products they come across to like garbage and you know pet food left out on porches or um, animal feed and, and livestock lots and things like that essentially if they can if they can smell it and they can fit it in their mouths they can pretty much make use of it so based on just that wide variety of a uh, of a uh, food resources that they can make use of that's going to be one big reason that they do so well in such a wide wide variety of habitat habitats across North America as far as their behavior and movements are concerned, um, behavior, you, you hear hogs being very aggressive, and they can be. Uh, you know, for the most part, if they smell or see or hear you, they're going to run the other way. The exception to that is if you do have a, a, a hog cornered in, in, the, in the instances of, of hunting or maybe walking through the woods and you get in between a, uh, a sow and her young, they're, they're very protective of them, and, and they will charge. That's why you hear the stories of and you've seen the videos, I'm sure, too, of, of hogs chasing down uh, hunters or, or hikers if, if they feel cornered or, or threatened. That they, they can they they can revert to not just running away, but also chasing and, and uh, trying to intimidate and, and ward off predators that way. 
Um, they can be fairly nomadic, especially when food sources are scarce, again, because they can make use of so many different food sources. They can roam around and, and kind of become opportunistic and feed on, on what's prevalent at the time. You know, for example, when, when acorns are dropping uh, versus when maybe, um, you know, fawns are hitting the ground and young mammals are available to, um, you know, spring peeper hatches and things like that as they're feeding on amphibians. So they can be opportunistic and, and nomadic that way. Um, they are fairly good swimmers. Um, again, that's a, that's a water adapted animal. They're very closely related to water and swimming is not an issue for them whatsoever. So rivers and, and water bodies are not a, are not an impedance to their expansion. Uh, and they do run pretty fast too. If a hog's chasing you down, uh, it's going to run faster than we can about that 30 miles per hour. It, but overall their movements are going to be primarily determined by food availability, um, water, and also reproduction. As far as our social, social structure is concerned, this, this is important when it comes back to the control, but the boars are gonna be solitary um, and they're really only gonna be in, in, in larger herds on account of uh, reproduction and then also just overlapping for you know, good quality, high abundant food sources. You might find them uh, all intermingled, but for the most part, the boar is gonna be a lone animal. Um, as far as sows and piglets are concerned, they're a very strong family bond. They're very family oriented animals. Um, they're going to travel in what we call sounders. Uh, those are the sows and their young. And a lot of times you will have um, multiple sows and youngs traveling together, kind of the safety in number sort of approach. Um, so that sounder uh, terminology is essentially just the family group of sows and piglets. That's going to be important later on when we talk about control also. As far as how do I know if I have pigs on the property or how do I know if this is pig sign versus others, we'll go, go through a few pictures here and, and some examples of what sign they leave. Um, you see the rooting there in, in that picture of a, of a uh, looks like a cattle pasture located within, within a wood lot. Um, they have very strong, powerful snouts and it's just amazing what a group or a sounder of hogs can do overnight. That's not so much just one boar. Um, but that type of a damage can be can be can be literally showing up overnight if you get a large enough group in there, or of course if there's a good food source, and they're repeatedly coming back to the same area, you'll end up with that damage too, with just a whole lot fewer hogs. And primarily, what they're doing in a situation like this is they're digging up uh, insects, grubs, or also feeding on tubers and, and root systems of, of desi desirable plants. Here's a big question we get a lot too, is how do I differentiate between wild pig tracks and white-tailed deer tracks? And the, white, the wild pig track on the left, at the tip of the toes, you can see they're a lot more rounded and not near, a lot more oval shaped, not near as long and as pointed as that white-tailed deer track on the right. Um, that, that's by far the easiest way to tell the two apart, the, the very pointed toes of the white-tailed deer and the oval shape, rounded toes of the wild hog. In soft muds like that, it's, it's very easy to tell the difference. It, it can be a little bit more difficult on, on f more firm ground, but for the most part, you can you can pick up on that uh, rounded hoof. We can also see pig trails. They'll get in the wallows like you see on the right-hand side here, and they'll, they'll essentially get in the wallow to not only cool themselves down, but also cover themselves in mud to get some relief from uh, insects and, and ticks and things like that. And of course, as they leave those uh, muddy wallows or any other <clears throat> um, muddy or, or water uh, laden area and they travel through the woods you'll see mud uh, just um, deposited among leaves and, and, and branches and sticks and twigs like that to where a lot of times you're not going to see mud deposits like that from other animals like for example bear or raccoon or, or white-tailed deer or any other type of mammal that would overlap uh, in the distribution of the white or the uh, wild pig um, if you see muddy trails like that very often it's going to be um, deposited by uh, feral hogs. We'll also see rubs as they get out of those wallows they'll go and rub the mud off and um, try to slough off some of the again some of the insect pests that they're, that they're dealing with and even just like you would see with cattle too just to just to itch and relieve, relieve themselves that way so you'll see a lot of that mud deposited on what we call rubs. Uh, generally that's going to be about in that you know three foot and lower or less as far as the height on the tree. Large boars can leave some pretty substantial rubs but for the most part you're going to see those rubs at, at two feet and, and less at the ground level along trees just like you see there. And something else as far as um, the, the maternal uh, instincts of a, of, of a hog, they do make nests. Just like you see there, they'll push down and gather up palmettos to make a nice nest to, to uh, uh, drop their litter of, of, uh, of piglets. 
Um, and a lot of times they'll have some overhead structure too to actually keep the rain off of the off of their young too. So they're they're really good mothers, and you can see those hog nests. They they uh, they can even come back to use the same ones time and time again. But oftentimes they'll make they'll make nests like that throughout the landscape that you can find. And they're they're really a whole lot more distinct when you have the that palmetto bedding that, that that they can make up. If we've got a lot of deciduous forest, it's not nearly that distinct. But certainly in the in the palmetto type areas, you'll see that in swamps and lowlands, and especially here in the southern part of, of my state of Alabama. And the droppings can be pretty, um, pretty aromatic, <laughs> but also pretty distinctive. Just in far as as far as the shape is concerned, um, they have more of a globular structure to their to their droppings. Um, whereas white-tailed deer would, would would really only be the the only other animal that would be leaving to be relatively similar to to uh, wild pigs. But they're going to be a lot more. Um, uh, uh, distinctive in in their pellet shape than what the more like I say the more the more globular structure of a of a wild hog scat would be. Um, additionally, you can have a black bears leaf leaf scat that can be similar to this. That 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 can be somewhat confusing. And again, because black bears are pretty omnivorous, um, their their scats can be very similar. Um, but again, if if it's fresh uh, pig droppings, there there's a, a pretty unique aroma associated with that. The pretty pretty strong smell that you're not going to see from white-tailed deer or, or even bears for that matter. So what happens when you got feral hogs on a property? Well, there, there's good news. There, there's two great things about feral hogs is they are, they are fun to hunt. Um, many states, you can hunt them throughout the year um, because they are not considered a game animal uh, by many states. So they do offer a seasonal or, or season-wide uh, hunting opportunities. So some folks do, do appreciate that. And they really are good to eat, um, properly prepared. Um, there, there's a there, there's a lot of good table quality to to a feral hog, especially especially the, the uh, younger ones. Um, but that's a pretty short list as far as what's great about feral hogs. It's those two things. It's it's difficult to think of many other positives surrounding this animal. So in general, you know, when we see feral hogs move onto a property. A lot of landowners kind of see them as a novelty at first. And, you know, I gave you the calculation there on kind of the explanation of the pig bomb. So, you know, the first few hogs you see on a property not causing a lot of damage. They're, they're fun to hunt and chase after uh, folks aren't really in a big hurry to control them. But within that first year, year or after that first year or two, um, they get fed up and they're ready to, to go up after the control methods. And that's when we get the call as extension agents to help with that process. Um, and also the reason that we care so much about wild pig control, here's some numbers behind that. And, and this has been fairly consistent, but it's about a 1.5 billion um, uh, in damage throughout the U.S. on an annual basis. And that number surely can fluctuate a little bit, but that 1.5 billion number has been around for the last few years. Um, so I'd argue that it's even a little bit higher than that by now, as well as these Alabama and Georgia figures here of just $50 million a year uh, in crops alone in Alabama and 80 million with the uh, crops just there in Southwest Georgia. And their damage can be widespread. We're not just talking about egg damage, but it's also turf and roads and equipment and fencing. Um, and when we say turf, you know, there's not many of us across the states that don't have a, a lawn surrounding our home. And, and we see a lot of impact in, as far as wild pigs are concerned in, in that avenue too across the U.S. and not just in Alabama, but like I say, per, pretty widespread. If you've got grass growing, you have the potential to have hog damage. Uh, and they also alter ecosystems. And this impacts everybody too in terms of erosion and also water quality. Um, this, this day and age when, when we put so much of a value on water quality and the cost to have good clean water. Uh, that's something that makes uh, the feral hog problem relevant to everyone, whether you're having damage on your property or not. And also they do compete with native wildlife. That's not important, just important in terms of if you're a, a hunter trying to manage wildlife, but also if you're just trying to, to view wildlife, um, hogs can have an impact on that. And we'll talk about some specific examples here too. As far as the egg crops, you know, we gave you that list and we keep saying opportunistic uh, omnivores. So Pretty much, if we're growing it as an egg crop, the uh, the hogs are going to make use of that crop and 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 show interest and you know ultimately cause damage. So, not only just from consuming the crop, but they'll also get in there and root around other insects that are growing growing within that crop, or just to eat the roots of the crop themselves. Uh, they'll they'll trample and lay down um, some of the uh, uh, some of the agricultural products too, and they'll also just dig them up before they even have a chance to produce. Uh, also, as far as roads are concerned, I've seen hogs dig up hard packed gravel roads in 
uh, you know, Lord knows why they're digging under there, whether it's for insects or what the reason is, but they will absolutely uproot a road. Uh, they'll damage equipment and facilities um, as far as the fencing, you know, concern there. Chicken wire is not going to hold out a hog. And as they rub and, and trample uh, equipment, that's going to be a cost to the farmer or egg producer also. And livestock predation, um, you know, newly birthed um, livestock is, is susceptible to hog predation. And also disease is a pretty big issue too. We'll talk about disease right here in a little, in a little bit more detail. Um, brucellosis and pseudorabies are the two primary diseases you always hear come up when we discuss feral hogs. And that's probably because they're because they're the most impactful. Um, brucellosis is very important, especially if, uh, if you or, um, or folks you know are hunters, um, that can affect humans. Um, and it's spread primarily through handling the reproductive organs. So if you do end up processing feral hogs, um, it's very important to wear gloves and, and, and be sure to stay away from uh, the, the sex organs on, on a hog as you are processing that animal. That, that is important. There's a lot of folks that get lax with that. And, and, and don't don't give themselves just the simple protections of, of latex gloves while cleaning an animal. And as far as pseudorabies are concerned, humans aren't affected by that, but it does uh, affect livestock. Um, and just as you see in the picture in the bottom left, just a hog coming up to a, a cattle facility there, pseudorabies is spread just by secretions of the hog, um, whether it's through uh, nasal or, or venereal sec secretions too. So just even having uh, wild pigs in proximity to livestock is, is certainly a risk as far as disease transmission. As far as natural resources are concerned, um, they're an impact not just on the habitat for our native species, but also directly to the species themselves. So, of course, there's going to be resource and habitat composition whenever you have overlapping distributions of hog and, and our native game species. As far as white-tailed deer and wild turkey are concerned, you know, who's going to find that acorn, uh, that lone acorn on the, on the forest floor first? If it, I'd probably put my money on the feral hog outside of a deer or a turkey. So you have that competition for food resources. And we've even seen numbers of squirrels uh, declining in, in areas with heavy, with heavy hog populations. You know, as, the, as those hogs exhaust um, the hard mast um, crop, you know, squirrels just don't have enough to store and make it through the, through the season. So we've even seen squirrels become impacted by uh, high uh, feral hog densities. Opportunistic predation, of course, it's just like with livestock as turkey nests are on the ground or when, uh, you know, deer fawns are, are, uh, are newly born, um, they are all very susceptible to hog predation. And, 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 that, and that has been, has been shown maybe not to be a long lasting impact, but certainly for that, for those few weeks where those fawns and nests are vulnerable, um, you can see hog consumption and, and impact that way. And as far as the wildlife manager trying to manage and enhance game populations, things like food plots and um, supplemental feeding, tree establishment, things along those lines, hogs make that very, very uh, difficult, if not even impossible in some places where they become in high density. Um, we just see those enhancements and, and that stewardship on the landscape for other native species um, just becomes extremely costly, if not completely non-existent and, 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 and really, in, really ineffective. So let's talk about managing feral hogs now. Um, I'd be remiss as an extension agent not to throw up this graph. Uh, anytime we talk about a pest, really for, for, uh, for, for any reason, um, it's important to, to kind of refresh our minds of the integrated pest management model. And that's as many of these cogs of this uh, model that we can uh, apply to uh, a pest, the more successful we're gonna be in its control. So we have here repellents, uh, habitat management, exclusion, and population management. The more of these we can apply, Fly to feral hogs, the better off we're going to be. But right off the bat, there really are no effective repellents for feral hogs, and habitat management is very, very difficult for feral hogs. And we'll talk about that here more in just a moment. So already, you know, that's two strikes out of the model, which is just another example of just why hogs have been so difficult to control, uh, even on a fine scale across across the landscape, just because we're so limited in what options we have available to control them. So let's just take a look at habitat management here really quick. Um, so for, for, for hogs, what are the necessities as far as uh, habitat is concerned? Uh, well, food, of course, is a necessity, but like we talked about, it's very difficult to limit the food for hogs because they can make use out of almost anything. Like I say, if they can, if they can sniff it out and fit it in their mouth, um, they're going to make a living off of it. So very difficult to reduce the food opportunity for hogs. As far as water is concerned, particularly here in the southeast, um, we have a whole lot of water. It's very difficult to go for more than a mile or so without hitting a creek or river, stream, uh, pond, reservoir, lake, something like that. So water is essentially un un uh, un 
a, a, a resource that we can't control here in the southeast. Um, the one thing to note that, you know, we just had a pretty significant drought here uh, in North Alabama um, two years ago, and we do see hogs recede with the drought as those creek arms and, and swamps dry up, you will see hogs kind of revert back to main water bodies, and it can take them a little while to come back to the areas <clears throat> that they were otherwise inhabiting. So that is one thing to note. But just because you had hogs recede on account of the drought doesn't mean that they're not coming back. They, they, they will be back as those waters return. Um, as far as shelter and cover is concerned, the favorable habitat they have, um, like I said, the, the big component for a hog is gonna be water and shade as far as their comfort is concerned. So swamps and woods and fallow fields are all very favorable, favorable wildlife habitat, especially when it comes to hogs. Um, so again, very difficult to get rid of swamps, woods and fallow fields. That's just part of, part of the landscape, especially here throughout the Southeast. So as far as habitat management is concerned, we just don't have a lot of options. So let's talk about some other control methods, which these are all gonna be in terms of the population reduction um, and also um, exclusion. So we see here some of the methods that folks are constantly bringing up, um, exclusion and fencing, aerial gunning, toxic snares, hunting with dogs, uh, shooting or hunting, uh, contraceptives and feeding and trapping. Um, the only ones that are really proven successful are exclusion, uh, toxicants, and we'll talk a whole lot more about those in detail, as well as shooting and hunting. Um, contraceptives are, are something that we'll, we'll speak more on, and then also we'll get into great detail with trapping. So as far as contraceptives, what makes an effective contraceptive? Well, it's gotta be long-lasting, cost-effective, um, ideally, through oral or nasal administration. That's so that we don't have to go out there and shoot each and every individual uh, animal to administer a contraceptive. Uh, that cost is extremely high on the feasibility to be extremely low in the case of pigs. Um, it has to be species specific in this case. We only, we only wanna be sterilizing our pigs. Um, it has to be stable, of course, in field conditions. Environmentally friendly is always a plus. Humane is, is mandatory nowadays, as well as what happens when someone goes and harvests that pig that's, that's received that contraceptive? It's, is it gonna be safe for them? So that's a whole lot of uh, very involved variables there when it comes to contraceptives. So contraceptives sounds like a great idea right off the bat, but when we start to really dig into it, that, that's a whole lot of uh, very detailed caveats we've got to look through to try to um, you know, nail down and, and confirm before we're able to administer a successful contraceptive. So at this current date, we've only had it tested in lab settings. And this is, and I put this up, we're still refining the process. Every four to five years, we're still four to five years away, it seems like. Um, so that's just kind of the, you know, the carrot just keeps getting held out in front of us, just keeps getting moved. So at this point, I don't really want to put a time, time frame on it. Um, we've been saying four to five years for a, a, an awful long time now. So contraceptives aren't, aren't looking very promising. Um, the big thing is taking it from the lab to the wild populations. Um, how do we deliver it? What's the dosage? How do we make them or consume it? And then also, um, will it make lethal techniques more, more effective? Going back to the IPM model, um, it's, it would certainly appear that way. If we can get a contraceptive on top of other lethal techniques, you know, we'd really have something going for us. But at this time, this is uh, just something that we don't see uh, you know, coming to market within the very near future. So we'll kind of X that out. As far as exclusion is concerned, it can be very, very effective, whether it's just standard uh, fencing or whether it's electrified. Um, the pros of that is, is you can certainly keep hogs out of an area um, just the same way that you can keep cattle within an area or uh, you know a, a hog operation you can keep cattles within or you can keep um, pigs within your hog operation so we can certainly uh, keep pigs out um, and you can also incorporate you can see in this top picture here we've got a uh, an, an exclusion fence but also within that fence we have, we have a built-in gap and a uh, a push door style trap to where as hogs are roaming that fence, they find their way into the trap to where you kind of incorporated both techniques. They're not just exclusion, but also population management. And this is extremely effective to you when you've put the hog up and you've put the fence up and excluded hogs after the fact that they've already been in an area. So they're used to coming to the area to feed, they'll, they'll travel the fence, they'll find that trap. Um, so it, it's a good built in uh, IPM, not just exclusion, but also population management. Of course, the cons with fencing are exactly what you'd expect. They're going to be expensive as far as materials. You've got to install them. They have to be very stout. You know, just a barbed wire fence is not going to keep pigs out. You have got to use um, cattle panels that also have a fine mesh at the bottom. Uh, and we'll give some of those details when we start talking about our corral style traps. And the reason that is, is that young piglets are very small and they can squeeze through um, larger meshes. 
Um, it's important to understand that hogs can dig, so you're going to have to have somewhat of an, either an apron uh, when you install that fence or actually uh, bury that fence below the surface. And again, like all fences, you're going to have perpetual maintenance. There's going to be failures and compromises within that fence, um, trees falling on it, things like that. So you do have to maintain a fence just like anything else. But exclusion does very well, especially for protecting you know, smaller resources or properties. And as far as lethal control is concerned, so how many do I have to remove to be effective and really see impacts and population level reductions with lethal control? Well, in, in, the, in the literature, we found over and over again that we're seeing 80, even in populations with 80% mortality, you're still not seeing long-term decrease in that population. So that's pretty disheartening right there in terms, especially when you talk about uh, our next control techniques here of, of hunting and then we'll come into some other uh, lethal control te techniques here too but so what are the pros of uh, hunting pigs is, is you can kill a few pigs of course um, but that's also one of the cons you're only killing a few pigs so going further into the cons is someone has to be there hunting the pigs and be successful uh, the pigs are not always there when you are it is hunting it's not shooting so there's days you'll kill a few and there's days you won't see pigs um, the big trouble is, is when you're out there hunting pigs and killing individuals, you're educating the other pigs that were not taken that day. Uh, so it becomes constantly more difficult to find those hogs and, 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 and actually successfully hunt and take those pigs. So you're constantly getting, in, you're constantly educating an already intelligent animal. Um, and also this is important too that folks don't usually think of is that you've got a lack of hunter persistence. You know, that hunter gets one or two hogs in the freezer and that's about all they can consume for the year. It's hard to get them to come back out to the property to keep hunting pigs. And also, if they have done a good job and really reduced the pig, pig population on a small area, when those pig numbers are low, that's when the hunters disappear. They're not going to come out to, to, you know, to, to shoot or hunt a pig uh, when they're only seeing you know, one every, every week or so. And also, you got to look at the issue of two of hunting big boars versus uh, piglets. You know, one's way more exciting than the other. And you got to kill a lot of pigs. Like I say, you got to be killing over 80%. That's difficult to do over hunt with hunting. Now we get the next question of what, well, what if I hunt them over bait? It's all the same cons with two more added cons. Um, feeders cost time and money. You got to purchase the equipment. You got to keep them filled up and that bait costs money. And like we say too, hogs are hogs. Are hogs. They're going to eat a lot of bait and it's just going to be that much more of an expense without that much more success. And then we have the question too, what about night shooting? Um, it's a really good idea until it's 3 a.m. and you got to be to work at 8 a.m. So you've got to be out there at nighttime hunting these pigs. Um, the big thing is that the equipment's expensive. Pigs don't have eye shine. You can't use simple lights like you can with a uh, white-tailed deer. Shining lights when you're going through the fields, not that that's illegal of course, but that's an example of seeing that light shine the same way you would on raccoons. Pigs don't have that. You need thermal spotting scopes and, or infrared scopes and things like that. The pigs have to be there. You're only killing a few pigs at a time. And again, you're educating the pigs that you don't kill. So bringing it back together, the last two we're going to talk about here as far as really being effective in control are toxicants. They'll reduce damage and eradicate a population in small areas, as will trapping. So let's go ahead and hit on those two next here. We're getting pretty close on time. I want to be sure to leave some time for questions. So as far as toxicants, the reasons that I get so many questions on toxicants as an extension agent is because they take so much less cost and so much less time over those other methods of shooting and trapping like I just mentioned. Uh, and they can also really increase the efficacy of, of those other techniques we've already talked about today. They can be used in a wide variety of habitats and situations. They can very quickly reduce populations. And this is the big one is you have potential with toxicants for very specific delivery to make sure that just the animals that you wish to poison receive that toxicant. So this is the big player in the toxicant uh, game right now with sodium nitrite. It's the same preservative we see in a lot of our meat products. Uh, they create a very shelf stable product that um, is going to uh, prevent botulism. Um, but at the same time, it's very toxic to pigs. And here's the big issue that we have is it's also toxic to raccoons and bears. And essentially what this is doing as far as a, a good humane toxicant is within an hour, hour and a half or so of uh, consumption of this uh, uh, sodium nitrate, pigs essentially, it reduces the uh, hemoglobin uh, to methemoglobin, to which is going to reduce oxygen transport. Essentially the pigs pass out they don't wake up, there's no more oxygen to the brain. So it's a very fast acting humane toxicant. It's also cheap and pretty stable. 
and we're working on it being more target specific. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, very little residue in the environment and it's also palatable to the animal. So it's a lot of positives with sodium nitrate. Here's the obstacles. We got it to where it's encapsulated so pigs don't smell and taste it. They're eating it. That's not a problem. It's very stable. The dosages are figured out. The big trouble is the non-target species, black bears and raccoons. Where, where bears overlap with, uh, and of course raccoons are gonna overlap most in most places, but uh, where black bears overlap, that's where we really become, begin to find the issues with toxicants. As far as the delivery method, this is what we're really looking at right now. When I, when I say us, it's gonna be the USDA Wildlife Services. Um, they're looking at delivery stations to where only pigs can or hogs can access that bait. Um, so right now, um, and of course, I've got here too the public acceptance of poisoning, but with, with feral hogs, it's not so much of an issue. So right now, the USDA uh, uh, APHIS Wildlife Services has just released a fact sheet in January about the, the questions and answers related to sodium nitrite as a toxic bait for feral swine. If you search for that title right there, that fact sheet, you'll find that pretty easily online that goes over the ins and outs. Um, so, so currently, that not, sodium nitrate is under review. Um, and they're, they're looking at that possibly hitting the market in 2020, but of course being a restricted pesticide has a lot of regulation. Um, so let's talk about trapping here. Um, lots of pros to trapping. You can capture a lot of pigs quickly. Um, you can run multiple traps at a time with fairly little effort. It takes very little time to set the traps up and also maintain them. So that doesn't make them very cost effective. And we've also got really good trap technologies and research now available. The cons is if you don't do it right, you can certainly educate your pigs. Um, it can be seasonal. Pigs are not gonna come to a, bait, uh, a baited trap when there's other food sources on the ground. So we're looking at um, that late fall to early winter time frame can be, can be difficult because of the food resources on the ground. Um, uh, it's not quite as easy as it looks. Um, there's a lot of investment um, in materials, but that investment in materials can certainly pay off in damage reductions. And you have to do it right. You have to properly pre-bait, uh, provide surveillance, and also some self-control when setting that trap door that we're going to talk about here in a moment. Now here comes that term sounder again. That's the sows and their piglets. You want complete sounder removal. That's the goal in, in trapping pigs. Um, you want to make sure there are no females or young left behind. If you close that trap door and those pigs have seen that trap door close and they have not gotten trapped, you've also you've suddenly educated your, your, your pigs and they become very difficult, the, the remaining pigs that you've not trapped and they become very difficult to have them walk through that metal trap again. Um, but like we say here, the research shows that you can have lasting effects up to 16 months, pig free and heavy, heavy pig population areas and you can have even longer where you're dealing with some localized uh, populations. Here's some of the questions with trapping. Um, it's very important to have panels that are five feet tall, pigs can jump and they can climb. In this picture here in the upper right hand corner that uh, game camera picture you can see a pig climbing that fence if they're over five foot you're going to really reduce the, po the possibility of a pig hopping that fence and of course with a running jump they can they can breach a fence that's less than five foot tall next i'll get the question a lot is a box trap or a corral trap better um, and you see this fact here let's answer it really quick that the capture rate in corral traps was more than four times that of box traps in addition a box trap that has a top on it like that box see in the picture the other game animal we have that really favors corn is a white-tailed deer. If a white-tailed deer walks into that trap, it'll oftentimes stress itself to, or kill itself trying to jump out of the top of that trap. So we do not like traps with tops on them like that. So the corral trap style is the way to go for that complete sounder removal. And what looks better here, trapping one lone pig or that entire sounder? Um, I think the, the corral trap pretty well speaks for itself. We've had a lot of good success with that throughout the country. Um, so continuous catch doors, do they work? There's different, there's different, tiles, different styles of doors where pigs can push through one after another and continuously, those traps can, can continuously catch pigs, saloon, rooting, or trainer. Um, but you see the stat there, that only 11 of 222 pigs that they've seen on camera push through the doors. That's less than 5%. So after that initial pig pushes through, very difficult as that pig is becoming stressed in that trap and realize that, that realizes that it is trapped it's very difficult to have other individuals push through in that situation so continuous catch doors are certainly not in favor for pig trapping rather we we'd like to see folks use a guillotine style door whether it's a homemade uh, plywood door like you see there on the left or, or a prefabricated uh, wider uh, uh, berth door like you see there on the right the guillotine style door is the way to go this allows all pigs to enter the trap 
And then once um, the trap is set off or the root stick is tripped, which I'll show you a picture of the root stick here in a moment, then we trap the entire sounder at one time. So in these uh, corral style traps, we're looking at a three panel trap. They're gonna be circular uh, in form and we do that so that pigs can't all ball up in a corner and then begin to jump on top of each other and jump out. We want it circular where there are no corners. T posts every four feet where they can't bend these uh, uh, corral traps over. And you're using 16 feet by five foot tall panels with a two to four inch mesh, especially at, at the bottom of that trap so that the piglets can't squeeze through. If the piglet's squeezing through, you're not going to uh, control your pig uh, problem. As far as baiting the traps, we get questions whether we use soured corn, regular corn, or both, uh, which works best. And basically there's been no difference. Um, they do say that pigs fed slightly longer on dry corn. So there's really no trouble to go through uh, souring the corn as far as these traps are concerned. So when we talk about baiting the traps, you'll have a little bit of bait that leads through the door of that guillotine style trap around the outside circumference of that trap and then a pile of corn in the middle of the trap by that root stick right there that you see on the right hand side. So the idea is pigs walk in, feed around the perimeter of the trap as the bait is consumed. They'll then find that root stick in the middle of the trap, setting the door off and uh, trapping all pigs at one time. Here's the uh, Cadillac approach when it comes to uh, trapping pigs. There's remotely activated traps and essentially it's the same idea as a corral style trap with the exception that you can remotely set the trap doors off by a cell phone. So you can set traps off regardless of really where you are in the country. Uh, and these are uh, done through surveillance of, of uh, real time wildlife cameras as they show the entire sounder within that trap. You dial a code and the gate door drops. They can be expensive at two to $3,000 for the door system, but again, they can be very effective and can, don't require you to, uh, to be there to set them off. So you have to start off on the right foot. Scout your potential trap locations where there's pig usage. Use the right trap, the corral style with the guillotine door like I just outlined. Uh, Pre-baiting the traps properly, uh, that is important. You don't want to set your doors right away. You want to pre-bait traps, get uh, pigs accustomed to walking in the trap and then once you have the entire sounder within that trap then you begin to set your root stick or get ready to close the guillotine door once they are uh, all using the trap and, and inside. Um, next up it always helps to use automatic feeders to save time and also to condition pigs at the time that feeder goes off they know to come to the trap that's also helpful. Game cameras are important to go ahead and determine the number of pigs that are not only in that sounder, but also the number of pigs that have begun to enter that trap. You don't want to set your door until the surveillance camera tells you that your traps are entering or that your sounder is entering that trap, each and every one. You want to properly bait the traps, just like I had outlined around the circumference and then around that root stick. And you also want to be patient. Don't get in a hurry and set that door if the entire sounder isn't entering that trap. Otherwise, you're going to educate your pigs. It's not about how many pigs you caught. It's about how many pigs you didn't catch. So future options uh, or possibilities are the toxicants. We're looking at that by about 2020, hopefully. Uh, oral contraceptives, again, we're, we're looking at, again, four to five years, every four to five years. So at this point, um, again, I, I'm not holding my breath or telling folks to look out for that. It's, it's more of uh, the, the toxicants that we're gonna be looking at here within the next few years. So in closing here, I've got some resources for you. You can find us on our extension website as far as other uh, publications related to wild pig management. Um, you can Google these uh, or research these uh, uh, two publications, Managing Wild Pigs, a, te a Technical Guide, and also a Landowner's Guide for Wild Pig Management. Those are available on many different extension uh, web pages and also uh, web pages throughout um, the internet. You can search for those titles and they will come up. In addition, we do have a YouTube playlist there that's uh, uh, put together through uh, Alabama Extension Agents on uh, Construct, constructing your own uh, guillotine style doors, how to process hogs, and uh, other uh, uh, caveats and tips and tricks on how to uh, effectively trap and control hogs. And in the state of Alabama, we have our state game agency, the Division of uh, Wildlife and Freshwater Fisheries, your state game agency, regardless of where you are throughout the country, will also likely have uh, assistance and resources related to wild pig populations and their control. Um, Here's the USD Animal Plant Health Inspection Service or APHIS. They are the ones that are currently reviewing um, the uh, toxicants uh, for wild hogs. And I wanted to put up here too the USDA NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. They have an office in every county too. There's the locator there. You can find the office within your county and in some counties throughout the state or throughout 
the state of Alabama and perhaps throughout the nation. I'm not familiar with other programs, but um, there is the NRCS Wild Pig Assistance Program, which can help to offset some of the costs associated to trapping and controlling wild hogs. So here is my contact information. We're pretty close on time. About 15 minutes for questions here. Um, and again, you can no, we, did, we did have one question uh, from Lila that asked, what keeps her populations in check in Europe? And in other locations, and Vicky provided some answer, said that feral populations are out of a pan in Europe also. I didn't know if you wanted to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, they are. Um, the, there, aren't, there aren't a whole lot of things keeping populations in check, even, even where they're native. Um, Europe is having just about as much trouble trouble with uh, feral hogs as we are. We've got extension specialists and professors throughout the universities that are flying back and forth throughout throughout Europe, uh, holding the same types of um, conferences and, and conversations that we're having here today in terms of feral hog control. Their predators are just so few and far between um, that, you know, without without this essentially the same control methods that we're that we just outlined here today um, they're, they're, they're not controlling hogs really any better than, than what we are. Norm, thank you so much. That was really informative. And uh, we're going to continue to field any questions anybody may have. We're going to throw out um, a few, just four, I believe it is, four or five questions we would quickly like everybody to answer. And um, feel free to throw out some more questions in the text box or question and answer if you have them, and we'll um, get them over to Norm. Oh, I forgot my last pig joke. There, there's the end. <laughs> They're cute little things when they're young like that. It's when they get bigger and destructive, they kind of fall out of favor. Any more questions? Does anybody have anything um, else they'd like to add? Thank you, Tim and Vicki, for joining us and um, all the information in the text box. That was really helpful. Well, without um, any other questions, Norm, you did an excellent job. That was really thorough. Thank and, you. I um, appreciate y'all having me. A lot as well, so I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I appreciate y'all having me. All right, and um, those who are attending, feel free. This um, webinar will go up on the website with links and let people know it's available and to continue to view it, um, it's been recorded. So, thanks. We did have the question too about it. Uh, if you'd like the PowerPoint, I, I'm glad to send that out uh, via PDF if anyone would like it. Okay. Thanks, Norm. That was awesome. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, Danny, next month, do you want to mention? I guess stay tuned next month for the for the second webinar in 2018. And that one's going to be on identifying um landscape pest. Hey, there it is. I'm trying to, rem to remember and there it is, misidentified pest in the landscape. So that's, that's going to be a really good one as well. And we thank you all for, for joining us and we'll see you next month. Mm -hmm.